good morning once again, and uh, great to be with you as we continue this series in 1 Corinthians, and our topic today is sex, marriage, and divorce, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 to 24. Let's come to God in prayer and uh, pray that he'll be at work among us. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we come now to your word, help us to trust in your good purposes for our lives. We know that our bodies are meant to be temples for the Holy Spirit. So now, my, by your Holy Spirit, may you help us to believe uh, your word, to understand your word. Uh, help us not to live, uh, fall into temptation, uh, but rather to glorify you uh, in how we live as, as single people or married people. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, over the centuries, the church has faced various different theological challenges. Uh, in the early church, there were questions over the doctrine of Christ. What does it mean that he's fully God and fully man? Uh, then there were questions about the Trinity, the relationship between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. In the Reformation, the big question was, how are we saved? Justification by faith alone and all that. In the 19th century, it was the authority of the Bible. In the 20th century, it was the role of the Holy Spirit and spiritual gifts. But as we come now to the 21st century, the big questions of our day are about who are we as human beings? And in particular, questions about sexuality and about marriage. Uh, the institution of marriage has been increasingly under attack in our day. At first, no-fault divorce some decades ago, sex without, outside of marriage, uh, the rise of pornography on the internet, but most recently, uh, the redefinition of marriage with country after country uh, welcoming same-sex marriage and uh, promoting LGBT. Our world's rejection of God has increasingly led to confusion about who we are as human beings and a, a right view of our sexuality. And it's really important that we, we go back to the scriptures and understand how God has, has designed marriage and sex to be. Because in Genesis, we see that God is the creator of marriage. He created marriage to be a, a one flesh, lifelong union between a man and his wife, a covenant relationship marked by faithfulness to one another as long as they both shall live, a, a relationship of total vulnerability. They were naked but not ashamed, a, a relationship of, of ever deepening intimacy and trust and love, one flesh a relationship that would shine forth as a picture of the ultimate marriage between Christ and his church. But not only did God create marriage, but God created sex within marriage to strengthen that one flesh union, to be a source of, of joy and delight, to unite the husband and the wife in love, and in that context to produce children who would be brought up in the loving care of a new home. So the Bible has a beautiful picture of marriage and, and a beautiful picture of sex within marriage. It's so wonderful that the Bible has a whole book dedicated to celebrating sexual love within marriage. That is the Song of Solomon. God is for sex. He made it. And he knows the only fulfilling and true, uh, truly delightful place for sex is within the safe confines of marriage. And for many cultures where Christianity has spread, this understanding of marriage and sex has been woven into the very fabric of society uh, in ways that we don't even realise. Well, until now, as it's gradually being all cast aside. So it's important, and my aim this morning, is that God would remind us of his beautiful design for marriage and sex within marriage so that we may faithfully live it out uh, to his glory. Well, uh, we've seen that the letter of 1 Corinthians is written uh, to a church Paul planted uh, in Corinth, uh, a church that had been tremendously blessed by God and rich with, by his grace, but was nevertheless a church that was full of many, many problems. Uh, in chapters 1 to 6, Paul has dealt with uh, various issues that have been reported to him. Uh, divisions in the church, uh, sexual immorality in the church, lawsuits in the church. Uh, but now as we come to chapters 7 to 16, uh, a new section of the letter, he turns now to various questions that they have asked him in a letter they've sent him. 
And in chapter 7, the questions are about sex, marriage, and divorce. Now, well, firstly, he answers their questions about sex and marriage, the first point this morning. Verse 1. Now, concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. So Paul references their letter, and then he quotes from it. Uh, it seems that there was probably a group among the Corinthians who thought that it was more spiritual to be celibate, to refrain from sex. Perhaps they thought that, that sex was somehow too fleshly, too uh, un unholy and unspiritual. Um, perhaps a little similar to the view of Roman Catholicism, which prevents nuns and priests from marrying so that they can be more holy. Now, it's a quote that Paul agrees with in part, uh, provided that we can be uh, self-controlled. Singleness is better than marriage in providing the context for undivided devotion of, to the Lord. We'll see that next week. For some, it is good to refrain from marriage and therefore refrain from sexual relations. But Paul only agrees in part uh, look at verse 2. He says, But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife, and each woman her own husband. See, Paul sees a very real temptation to sexual immorality for those who do not have a proper outlet for godly sex within marriage. Uh, by sexual immorality here, Paul means any kind of uh, sexual stimulation outside of the confines of Marriage. I think as we look at the fruit of Roman Catholicism, uh, where, where Catholic priests have often engaged in illicit you know, sexual activity, uh, we can see the truth of what Paul is writing here. And to prevent this temptation, Paul encourages married couples to engage in sex. He says, each man should have his own wife, each woman his own, her own husband. Now, having your own wife or husband here is not talking about getting a husband or wife or having one. It's a polite way of talking about sex. He, we see that as he goes on in verse 3. Uh, the husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, and likewise the wife to her husband. Uh, conjugal rights means married rights. And again, he's talking in a polite way here about sex. Now, it may surprise some of us this morning to see how pro-sex the Bible actually is. Uh, within marriage, the Bible sees sex as an essential ingredient to be desired and something even to be commanded. Sexual pleasure within marriage is a good thing to be celebrated. And we see that, for example, in Proverbs chapter 5, uh, verse 18, Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your, your youth, a lovely deer, a graceful doe. Let her breasts fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always in her love. Husband and wife are meant to pursue the pleasures of sex within the, the confines of marriage. Now, I want you to see how radically countercultural, though, the Bible's view of sex really is. Uh, not only uh, when Paul originally wrote this, but in our day too. The first century, of course, was a patriarchal society. There was lots of things a woman couldn't do. But notice here the wonderful mutuality that Paul expects when it comes to sex. Look at verse 4. He says, For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. See, it doesn't matter that the, the husband is the head of the marriage, that the wife is the helper. The husband's body still belongs to the wife, just as much as the wife's body belongs to the husband. Each has authority over the other's body. And that means that married couples are not to deprive one another of each other's bodies. Verse 5 says, Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So we're not to deprive one another of this sexual intimacy. It's not about whether I'm in the mood. There will be times when we'll come home from work and we'll be totally exhausted, or we're just so tired from looking after the kids 
and doing the housework. And the last thing that we have on our minds is sex. But as I recognize that my body belongs to my spouse, I will make the effort to give myself in love for my spouse. Here's the Bible. Here, the Bible's view of sex is so revolutionary, isn't it? What it's showing us is that sex is not about me. Sex is not about fulfilling my needs when I need to. Sex is about service, serving the needs of my spouse, even with my own body. Now, notice Paul, though, he, he doesn't say to couples here, claim your rights, you have authority, you take what you want. No. Rather, verse 3 talks about giving your spouse their conjugal rights. The Christian life is never about taking. It's about giving. Sex is about service. So husbands, if you're listening this morning, if you are to serve your wife in love, you need to be sensitive to what she needs and wants, what will bring her pleasure in the bedroom. And wives, if you are to serve your husbands in love, you'll need to be sensitive to what he needs and wants, what will bring him pleasure in the bedroom. Because her joy will be found in giving pleasure to her husband. His joy will be found in giving pleasure to his wife. As they give themselves to one another in love, that will be the best sex of all. Not the, the selfish, tainted sex of our world that's all about me, but the self-giving service of a loving spouse who seeks the pleasure of their husband, even above their own needs. Now Paul is saying here that it's important for married couples to keep working at their sex life. Sex is not an optional extra that you just enjoy on your honeymoon. Again, verse 5, he says, Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time, that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. There may be a very limited place for a mutual break from sex, for a specific purpose, for a limited time. But in general, married couples are to keep intentionally cultivating intimacy in their marriage. And the reason we're told here is because we are naturally sinful people who are consumed with ourselves and not with others. The intimacy of sex takes effort, but if we give up on working on the sexual relationship with our spouse, then all we will achieve is to expose ourselves and expose our spouse to the disastrous temptation to look elsewhere for intimacy and love, to, to commit sexual immorality, to have an affair. So much marriage research tells us that, that problems in a marriage first show up in the bedroom. If you're failing to build intimacy in your marriage, failing to resolve conflicts, failing to show steadfast love, failure to spend quality time, failure to say loving words, then the first place it will show up is in the bedroom. And so if you are married and things are not going well in the bedroom, it's time to work on it before you grow apart as a couple before the temptation becomes real to look elsewhere, spend time together, building the intimacy, clear out time to be together, cultivate intimacy inside and outside the bedroom, spend time together, resolve disagreements, speak kind words of affirmation, do acts of loving service, give one another gifts and so on. Work on the marriage. It matters. Because our, our intimacy outside of the bedroom will encourage intimacy in the bedroom and vice versa. And it matters because sex is the superglue that holds marriages together. Sexual temptation is a, is a reality. It destroys marriages. It destroys families. It destroys churches. And so we must actively invest in our marriages. So do you see the choice that we have then? When it comes to sex, our choice is to marry and to cultivate the sexual relationship with my spouse. Or I remain signal, single, I don't marry, I refrain from sex, I'm celibate. But whether we are single or we are married, it's really important that we see both states as gifts 
from God. Have a look with me at verse, verse 6. Now as a concession, not a command, I say this. I wish that all were as I myself am. But each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. Here Paul offers us another radically countercultural perspective on marriage. That is that not everyone will or should be married and that's not a bad thing. I think there's uh, probably almost nothing considered more important in Asian culture than marriage. You know, alongside respecting your elders, uh, being successful uh, in your business maybe, or career, marriage is considered one of the highest virtues of life. Which means that in our culture we find it very easy to idolise marriage, to, to look for meaning and purpose in life, uh, in, uh, to find our meaning and purpose in finding a marriage partner and having a family. And we may start to think that if we don't get married, we may never find joy or happiness in life. Our parents might say, if you're not married, then you're, you're only living half a life and other unhelpful things. We, maybe we'll even start to doubt God's love for us because he hasn't given us this good thing that we long for. But Paul tells us here that both marriage and singleness are gifts from God. Marriage is a gift, yes. Singleness is also a gift. That should transform the way that we think about singleness. Perhaps we think that our singleness is a, is a curse, not a gift. We just wish we had one gift or, and not the other one. Uh, some churches and families like to do uh, secret centres, uh, you know, where everyone buys one another a gift, maybe with a value of 10 ringgit or less. And you can see as people open up the various gifts, one person says, oh, I wish I had that gift, that coffee mug, not this lousy notebook or whatever it is. Perhaps that's how we think about the gift of singleness. We just wish we had marriage instead. But both are gifts because both singleness and marriage can be used to glorify God and we're going to think a lot more about this next week. Uh, in fact, when you evaluate singleness and marriage in those terms instead of how they fulfill my needs, we may well come to the same decision Paul did, that singleness is actually better. Look at, again at verse 6. He says, Now as a concession, not a command, I say this, I wish that all were as I myself am. But each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. Now to the unmarried and the widows, I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried, as I do. Now I wonder if you believe that. There are certainly a lot of struggles in being single, but do you believe that singleness is not a curse? It's not bad, it's not deficient, it's not subhuman. It's good. Jesus was single. Paul was single. Some of the great Christian leaders of the 20th century were never married. But notice how careful Paul is and how he frames it. Though for some, singleness is better than marriage, he knows that it may not be better for everyone or in every circumstance. Verse 9, he says, But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry, for it's better to marry than to burn with passion. Paul knows we've all been given sexual desires. He knows that they can be hard to control. And so he thinks that for some, perhaps even most of us, it will be much easier to be godly in this regard in marriage rather than in singleness. And of course Paul doesn't mean here that the moment that you say your wedding vows that all sexual, sexual temptation will suddenly disappear. Uh, it doesn't work like that, does it? It's certainly possible to continue to struggle with sexual temptation even when you're married, even if you have a healthy sexual life with your spouse. Giving into sexual temptation, whether pornography, pornography or, or adultery, has certainly destroyed many marriages. Self-control is not an automatic thing, is it? But it's certainly easier to resist sexual temptation within a marriage than outside of one. So I guess the question is, how do you know which gift you have? The gift of singleness or the gift of marriage? Well, it's not a matter of how I feel or what I desire. Otherwise, I could just give up the gift of marriage when I thought that I no longer had the gift. 
And, and feeling that I have the gift of marriage doesn't mean that I'm necessarily going to get married. See? No, my gift is not about what I feel or what I desire. My gift is simply my current state, single or married. And of course, it might change at different points in life. For my first 30 years of life, I had the gift of singleness. Then I said my marriage vows, I received the gift of marriage. If my wife dies before me, my state will change again. I'll have the gift of singleness again. Whatever state we are in, whether we're single or we're married, it's a gift of God. We're to learn contentment. We're to see God's goodness in it. Well, that's sex and marriage. In verses 10 to 16, Paul moves, point two, onto the topic of divorce and remarriage. Divorce and remarriage. And it seems that some in the Corinthian church were taking things even one step further, uh, not just avoiding sex within marriage, but actually divorcing their spouse. Uh, perhaps because they were married to a non-Christian and they thought that continuing in the marriage would defile them, or perhaps because they just thought the single life was more godly. And again, Paul wants to correct these false views. Verse 10. He says, To the married I give this charge, not I but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband. But if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And the husband should not divorce his wife. Paul says it emphatically, doesn't he? Christians should not divorce from their spouse. When Paul says here, not I but the Lord, Paul doesn't mean that he disagrees with Jesus. What he, what he means is that he's, he's simply echoing or repeating Jesus' teaching. Jesus' teaching which prohibited divorce in every case except in the case of sexual immorality. Let's remind ourselves, uh, Matthew 5, verse 31 and 32, Jesus said, It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Or Matthew 19, 4 to 6. And Jesus answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, so they're no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. See what Jesus is saying. God's design for marriage is it's a permanent union, that the man and his wife hold fast to one another, no separation, no divorce, but a lifelong union where we keep our marriage vow to be faithful for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love, cherish and honour till death do us part. Now, of course, the Old Testament had laws that allowed divorce. Jesus referenced them just now. Motivated by love, uh, uh, God gave laws to limit the harm that a broken marriage could cause. Perhaps... Uh, a, a case like domestic abuse was in, was in their mind, where an abusive and violent husband harms his wife. Uh, God had laws in the Old Testament to protect people from such things. Let me say to you, if, if that dreadful thing is happening to you right now, please get help. Please talk to someone. Feel free to reach out. Get to safety. So the Old Testament had laws to, to, to limit the damage that a broken marriage could have. But divorce was never God's original intention. And so Jesus' reply here is firm. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Jesus is saying there's only one reason marriages end in divorce. And that is sin. It may be the sin of one party, it may be the sin of both. Perhaps one sins more than the other. But sin is always the cause of marriage breakdown. And it's always a tragedy. And it ought not to be among Christians. And yet the painful reality, which some of us know all too well, is that divorces do happen to Christians. And 
If you know people who have gone through that, then please show them love and care and remind them of the forgiveness and hope that Jesus brings. Well, notice also here Jesus' teaching on remarriage, verse 10. To the married I give this charge, not I but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband, but if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and the husband should not divorce his wife. So in the case of divorce, notice here remarriage is prohibited. Either the couple should remain unmarried or else be reconciled back to one another. And that too echoes the teaching of Jesus. Matthew 5, verse 32, I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Matthew 19, verse 9, I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. So to, for, to divorce and then remarry while your former spouse is still alive is adultery. Because in that remarriage, you are, you are now joining yourself in union to someone who's not your former spouse that you're pledged to love for the rest of your life. And so remarriage will be adultery except in a few specific cases, like sexual immorality. Uh, no, Notice here Jesus' exception clause. I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. So if your spouse commits adultery with another man or woman, then adultery has already happened. The marriage has already been broken by your unfaithful spouse. And so in such cases, the victim is free to remarry. Not the perpetrator. And Paul will give another exception in a moment, verse 15, for when our non-Christian spouse deserts us. But first he wants to make it clear that we as Christians should, should not initiate divorce with our Christian spouse, uh, except on those exception cases. Uh, verse 12, he says, To the rest I say, I not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. So marriage, what Paul is saying is marriage to a non-Christian is still marriage. And the Christian should do all they can to be faithful in that marriage. Paul explains a bit more in verse 14. He says, for the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife. The unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean. But as it is, they are holy. Now, Paul is not saying that the unbelieving husband or wife is saved by virtue of their marriage. He's simply saying that the marriage is legitimate. It's recognized by God. Because in some sense, by virtue of the marriage, the unbeliever has a, has a connection with the community of God's people. They're considered holy. So are the children. The children are not illegitimate. They are holy. So the fact that your spouse is a non-believer is no reason to divorce them. But there may be cases when the non-Christian spouse chooses to initiate divorce from their Christian spouse. And that's the second exception here that Paul allows for, for divorce. Verse 15, But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. And so if the non-Christian spouse deserts, then it's not wrong for the Christian to divorce and then remarry. For again, in such a case, it's, it's the other party who's already broken the marriage covenant. Now, I think it's legitimate uh, to extend this case to domestic violence cases as well. In each of these exceptions, the victim, but not the perpetrator, is free to divorce and then remarry. But outside of those exceptions, the Bible is very clear 
the Christian should never initiate divorce. And if they do, they must not remarry, or they'll com- they'll, they themselves will commit adultery, and they'll force their ex-spouse and their future spouse to do the same. Now, if we've understood all that, then we will see it's very important to choose carefully who I marry. We certainly shouldn't be so foolish to think that uh, we can marry a non-Christian and make them a convert, there'll be no consequences to it. Paul reminds us of that, verse 16, For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? Paul reminds us there's no guarantee that you can make your spouse become a Christian. My experience is it's usually the other way around. The Christian will become a non-Christian. If you're not yet married, marry wisely. Marry a Christian. Otherwise, they may desert you, or you may desert Christ, and neither of those are good results. Well, Paul closes this passage with a principle that has guided all his comments about marriage and singleness and divorce so far. Final point, remain as you were called. Remain as you were called. And that principle is expressed three times in verses 17 to 24. Verse 17, only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. At verse 20, each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. Verse 24, so brothers, in whatever condition each was called, there let him remain with God. Remain in the state to which you've been called. That's the principle, and it's already been expressed uh, earlier in the passage. Verse 8, to the unmarried and the widows, I say it's good for them to remain single as I am. Or verse 11, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. The principle is remain as you are. Maintain the state in which you became a Christian. That's the default principle. And he gives two other examples in verses 18 to 22 to help us understand this. Firstly, circumcision, verse 18. Was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. Now, most of us are not probably very bothered about circumcision, but what Paul is saying here is that what matters is not our physical appearance, but what's on our hearts. Are we keeping God's commands? Now, the second uh, example uh, he talks about here is slavery. Verse uh, 21, were you a bond servant when you were called? Do not be concerned about it, but if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. For he who was called in the Lord as a bondservant is a freed man of the Lord. Likewise, he who was free when called is a bondservant of Christ. You were bought with a price. Do not become bondservants of men. Now again, not many of us are slaves or liable to become slaves. But Paul's point again is don't focus on your physical state. Focus on your spiritual state. What, What matters is that we've been freed from sin and brought under the rule of Jesus. But notice Paul's uh, advice here, to remain as you are. It's not absolute advice. It's just the default position, the general principle. Because there are times and situations in life where, where change is called for. The slave doesn't need to seek his freedom, but if they've got the opportunity to be free, Paul says, take it. So also in verse 8, Paul encourages the unmarried to remain single, but then in verse 9 he says, if they can't exercise self-control, they should marry. Uh, He tells them, the married person, if your non-Christian spouse deserts you, let them go. The default position is remain, remain as you are, but it's not for all people at all times and in all circumstances. But it is, nevertheless, Paul's wise advice that we'll do well to take notice of. Remain as you are. Because ultimately what matters is not your physical state. Whether you're single or you're married, 
but our spiritual state and using that to serve the Lord. Well, we've covered a lot of ground there and uh, we need to conclude. Uh, today, I hope that you've been reminded with me of God's good design for marriage and sex. And that is that marriage is a, is a lifelong one flesh union between a man and his wife. Now, I hope you've seen that sex is an important way that we need to serve our spouse as we, as we give ourselves to them and so deepen the bond between us. I hope you've seen how both singleness and marriage are gifts from God that can be used to serve him. And so the principle is to remain as we were called, unless it's more God-glorifying to change our state. And I think we've seen that God's design for marriage and sex is both good and beautiful. We live in a world full of divorce. We live in a world full of sexual immorality. And there are so many broken uh, marriages, broken families, uh, and, uh, and terrible confusion going on around us. Uh, but in that confused world, we as Christians have the opportunity to show the watching world that God's ways are best, God's ways are good, that marriage and sex is best done God's way. So we have to trust him and embrace what he has commanded us here. And many times it will be hard. We need to put in effort to try again. Many times we will fail. And as we do, we need to always remember that there is healing and forgiveness as we return to Jesus and the cross. Ultimately, what matters is not our physical state, whether we're single or married, but our spiritual state. And as we turn to the Lord Jesus, no matter what sin is in our past, we can be washed, sanctified, justified. We can be set apart, blameless and holy before God and still used for his glorious purposes. Well, let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you today for reminding us of your good purposes for sex and for marriage. Whatever situation we're in right now, whether it's a joyful one or a very difficult one, whether we're single or we're married, whether we're married or we're divorced, Father, we pray that you would be with us, that you'd help us. You'd help us to recognise that every situation that we're in is a gift from you that can be used for your service. Help us, Lord, to be pure in our singleness, to be faithful servants in our marriages. And we do pray, Lord, that as we embrace your good purposes, that we may bear witness in this confused and dark world, that the world would see the goodness of following the Lord Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.